Douglas County. My name is Ann Jones Guider. I'm your commissioner for District 4, and this is District Dialogue. Each commissioner gets to uh, have special, their special guests uh, come and we film and, uh, on topics that we are, uh, the, hopefully, that the community is very interested in. And we um, uh, air it about every, uh, we will be airing this one in March for the entire month of March, in fact. But um, <clears throat> today I have a kind of a serious program. It uh, is about a need that we have here in Douglas County, uh, a critical need, in fact. And uh, I've got some very special guests here. And um, I'm going to uh, introduce, first of all, the director of DFACS, Ms. Dee Dee Artis. And uh, Ms. Artis, or Dee Dee, if you don't mind me calling you that, <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about what your job is. Okay. Well, and good what morning. DFAX is. All right. Well, good morning, Commissioner. Thank you for having me on here. Um, so I am Dee Dee Artis. I'm the Douglas County DFAX Director. Um, and in DFAX, we're a government agency here set in Douglas County. Uh, we serve the community needs uh, for Douglas County. Uh, we have two program areas um, that we service. Uh, we have our Office of Financial Independence, and those are the individuals who service the needs for the community that has Medicaid, um, the Supplemental Nutrition Program, as well as the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. The other program area that we have at Douglas DFAX is our social service program. Uh, this is where we have um, investigations of allegations from abuse and neglect of children mm -hmm. um, and foster care and adoption program area. So these are when children are no longer safe to stay in their homes and they're brought into the custody of the department and we try to work with the families to reunify our children back home. Mm -hmm. That's a big job. Yes. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, got the downside where you have to remove the children and then you've got the upside where you can place them in a safe place and hopefully permanently give them back to their, their parents at some point. But um, I know uh, it's, it would have to be very emotional. <laughs> and so I commend you for the job that you do. This is a hard job. Uh, next we have Mr. Mark Phillips and you are the resource uh, in the resource development uh, area of the DFACS. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I am. Uh, good morning, <laughs> Commissioner. As I said, my name is Mark Phillips and I am with the resource development with the DFACS agency. Resource development is the arm of the agency that is responsible for the recruitment, the approval, and the ongoing maintenance of foster slash adoptive parent homes. Okay. So we are in the business, for want of a better term, of recruiting individuals who have a passion mm -hmm. for caring for the children in the agency's custody currently mm -hmm. until they're either reunified with their birth parents or we have to find a more permanent placement for them in the case of adoptions. Right. So that's what resource development is all about. So you carry that child all the way through the, the system. Uh, from the time they are removed from the home until they are placed either back with their parents or with a foster uh, family. Um, <clears throat> and that's what we're going to be really talking about today because that's where the, uh, there's a critical need for foster families. So uh, welcome to the program. Thank you. And we will be talking about uh, specific areas that the community can help and also uh, how maybe the government can help. So, uh, all right, and then I have uh, Mark Alcaraz, who is the chairman of the Douglas County DFAX board. Uh, I assume you are elected by your peers uh, as chairman. I or, was. Okay, uh, and if you will tell us a little bit about the DFAX board. Well, the DFAX board, um, basically it's a supporting role for DFAX. Uh, we work alongside with Dee, Dee and the employees to uh, support our employees, to encourage our employees to help oversee the financials of the budget uh, for DFACS, for the, the yearly budget. Uh, we work along with Dee, uh to oversee needs such as, um, you know, uh, things for our foster families, care, uh, certain events of certain types of year 
where we might need some extra funding or anything like that. We oversee that and work with that. But the board is mainly in a supporting role for our director and its employees and also for those kids who are in our care. Now your funding, it comes from the state and federal and county. I know we fund something. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I don't know who wants to answer that. So uh. Yeah, so we have a state budget as well as a county budget <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that we are approved annually. Mm -hmm. And so um, our county budget really focuses on the needs of the foster children, um, clothing, um, Gosh, what else? extracurricular activities, extracurricular activities yeah. Yeah. school activities, school supplies, things like that, um, mileage for our foster parents, um, and our office supplies. Whereas our state budget really covers our placement cost for our mm -hmm. foster um, youth and our salaries and things like that. Mm, okay. Uh, can people donate to the cause that you were talking about, uh, about the uh, supplies and clothing and things like that? So, yeah, we do um, accept <laughs> donations. Uh, we would prefer either new or slightly used. Um, we have received donations of um, shoe boxes from our Optimus Club here in Douglas County uh -huh. that are, um, you know, Toiletries. hygiene um, oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. um, just little things for different um, genders as well as different age groups. Um, we receive a lot of um, donations of luggage because many of our foster children come mm -hmm. in to our custody and they don't have anything to carry their clothes or their personal belongings in. Oh. And we don't want them to carry anything, you know, like a trash bag or anything like that. Um, so we make sure that we provide them with, you know, an overnight bag or a suitcase. And so we get a lot of donations around that, mm -hmm. as well as clothes. We've gotten um, Burlington Coat Factory donated winter coats for all of Very our foster good. children. Yeah. We've had another group donate um, Converse sneakers for all all of our foster children wow. so we definitely accept uh, donations okay that's good to know uh, everybody probably out there listening to this has a set of luggage they no longer use up in the attic I know I do so <laughs> uh, don't be surprised if you see me driving up one day <laughs> um, Didi if you would uh, tell us a little bit about uh, well I think you've already touched on the circumstances in which children are removed from their home or their environment uh, and placed under the care of uh, DFACS. But uh, um, if you want to elaborate on that, please do so. But about how many children do y'all have in your care at this moment? Sure, I'll answer that. So we have 205 children in our um, Douglas County DFACS mm -hmm. um, custody. Um, there's a range of reasons why children are brought into our care. You know, our number one goal is to keep children with their families. Sure. And um, we try to do everything that we can, putting in support and services to that family to ensure the safety of a child at their home. Um, but oftentimes, it's just we're unsuccessful mm -hmm. with yeah. doing that. Um, and so the children do have to come in so that we can ensure the safety of that child. Some examples of why children come in could be the mental health, untreated mental health of the adults, mm -hmm. substance abuse, domestic violence. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of um, neglect, uh, lack of supervision, and even physical abuse um, of children. And, um, you know, reasons why they come into care. We also have a large group of kids who um, parents <clears throat> really have tried to provide services for their children. They've had, you know, the children have had criminal activity or untreated mental health, and the parents really have exhausted all that they can do uh, with the resources they have available. Mm -hmm. um, and so they request the children to come into our custody. So sometimes it's not just us bringing children in, it's the parents requesting for the children to come into our custody so that we may tap into some of those state and federal resources to provide for those high level needs of our children. Uh -huh. You know, I ran a, a Celebrate Recovery for about 16 years, and there were a lot of mothers that came through there, and their dry, their vision was to get their kids back. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had to jump through a lot of uh, programs. They had to go through programs of uh, parenting and things like that. But they were very, uh, they were often the most determined people to recover. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've seen a side of it that yeah. you're talking about. Well, um, 
Uh, how many of the children are placed here in Douglas County, or do you have to go outside of Douglas County to place them? So this is a struggle for Douglas County. Um, currently, we only have 50 of the 200, 205 children placed in a defects home. Um, we have another 67 of those 205 children placed with relatives or with uh, fictive kin, very close friends of the family. Mm -hmm. But the majority of our kids are placed with child placing agencies. Um, and a lot of times those are outside of the county, um, of, out of Douglas County. We have children placed throughout the state of Georgia. Um, we have kids in Muskogee County down in Glen County. Even oh. if their parents are still here in Douglas County? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's got to be hard. <laughs> it is very difficult uh, for a number of reasons. It impacts prolonging the permanency of that child um, because visits don't occur as often, unfortunately, because of the travel and the transportation issue of having the child transported back to Douglas County or having the parents transported to, to see their kids. Um, which then kind of trickles down is that, you know, parents are unable to really practice the parenting skills that they're learning yeah. um, to practice when they're having those visits with their kids. So it really does impact having these children outside of our county to the permanency of these kids. The last thing it impacts is... Now, when you say the permanency of the kids, are you talking about maybe foster, uh, not just fostering, but adoption? Sure. It, it, okay. It, it, it delays the permanency of the child to find that permanent home, whether that be back home with mom and dad or whether that be an adoptive home. Um, and the last thing and the, one of the biggest things, uh, Commissioner, is that it impacts the children. Sure. You know, when children are removed from their home, of course, they're removed from all of their uh, familiar surroundings inside their home, plus mom and dad, their pets. But now moving them away from their friends, their schools, the community that they're familiar with. Um, because they're in other communities around the state. So it really kind of um, impacts the children um, in the long run because they're in unfamiliar territory and all they want to do is come back home. You know, uh, often in a divorce or something like that, the kids think that the parents leave because of them. They blame themselves and they carry that guilt with them uh, all through their life a lot of times because they don't, under don't understand where's my mama, where's my daddy. And uh, they were here yesterday and they're gone. They, I must have done something wrong mm -hmm. to make them leave. So I, I can understand that. So what barriers do you have here in Douglas County in finding foster uh, families or, or it's not uh, foster homes, I should say. Sure. Um, so we have a, um, a group of kids with high level needs. Um, you know, we don't just bring in the small children or the babies. We bring in the teenagers. And if anybody's familiar with a teenager, uh, <laughs> they can come with their own struggles. But now we're talking about teenagers who have dealt with trauma, who have mm -hmm. been maltreated, neglected, or abused. Um, we have children who have been involved with the Department of Juvenile Justice, with criminal activity, autistic children. Um, these children require a higher level of supervision and care. And a lot of times that can be a barrier for foster families to be able to commit to that level of care that these children need. We also have a group of kids who belong to the LGBTQ community. Um, and they feel like they don't have a sense of belonging, um, that they're not welcomed um, with their, you know, with what they're dealing with internally. And so that can be a barrier um, to having foster families who are open to um, all these different types of children. Right, Mark, you're my, uh, that, this is your forte, I guess. So uh, if you want to elaborate on what she said, Dee Dee said. Absolutely, because that I believe speaks to the major challenges that we experience as an agency and as resource development workers. What you'll find happening is when you look at the children that we have in our care, their needs directly relate to the type of homes that we need. Um, there's an old adage that goes, you don't want to jump out the fry pan and jump in the fire. <laughs> so we're trying to create a scenario where our children are in a safe place. Yes. Safe on every level, emotionally, mentally, mm -hmm. physically, 
you know, spiritually. They want to be safe and they have to feel that safety. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between what we call felt safety and perceived safety. Yes. And so what happens is when a child feels safe, oh, yeah. they'll tend to perform better. Mm -hmm. So our challenge is to try to identify individuals not only willing, but have a basic understanding of what it will require to care for these children. And when we begin the process of recruiting and then going through the initial background checks on, and, and things of that nature, you'll find that it becomes a little bit more challenging. Some individuals go, whoa, not sure I'm ready for this. Yeah. Or they may have some other hesitations. Or they may be... Does race play a part of it? Anytime, uh, uh, like, uh, I know someone that that was fostering a, uh, it was a Caucasian couple that was fostering a black child, but they ended up adopting him. But I just wonder how much of a problem that may create. I don't know. Uh, and I just want you to be honest with the people. Uh, do, are there specific requests of your foster uh, families, I only want this, this, and this. Uh, so does it play well, a part? That is also an excellent question because I believe it's twofold in the sense that yes, we do have individuals who have preferences. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily I only want this type of child or that type of child, but they may have preferences. And those are sometimes based on myths and fears that mm -hmm. perhaps I can't be a good parent to a child of a different ethnicity. And those are, as I said before, mostly myths. And having that really candid conversation, those tend to disappear rather quickly. Yeah. So that's not an issue. The second part to that is the agency does not discriminate. Good. Absolutely Good. not. And so do we have a preference to say a Caucasian to care for an African-American child? Doesn't matter. Uh -huh. A parent is a parent. And if they're loving, they'll accept whoever y'all send to them, so. There you go, there you go. <laughs> And I yeah. would also add that, I mean, we, we have single parents, we have same-sex couples um, who are raising kids and fostering kids. So, you know, again, it's, it, the myth that you have to be a married heterosexual couple no longer exists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, anybody who has that heart of what Mark was talking about, willing to meet the, you know, the mental, physical, and um, emotional needs of these children, mm -hmm. come contact us. Like, we want to hear from you. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I may even go a step further to say that a lot of our kids are beginning to experience gender identity concerns and challenges. I am actively recruiting individuals who have that experience and that background. As long as we have addressed all the safety concerns in terms of the, the, the prospective caregiver and all the safety concerns has been addressed, th that's the core of it. So if you have an experience with gender identity, who better to help our children go through that phase of life? Well, that's why I celebrate recovery work. You know, uh, we would take someone that was healed from a drug addiction or anger or whatever it was, uh, even, um, uh, you know, people that tend to uh, try to uh, fix somebody. <laughs> but it, it was, um, we recycle those people. They became leaders mm -hmm. because who be better than an alcoholic can uh, relate to another alcoholic. So uh, uh, that's, that's kind of interesting there. The, you said that. Now, can the people or the um, uh, foster homes uh, um, the families or groups, I, I don't know, what's the term? <laughs> foster families. Uh, foster families. Can they adopt more than, I mean, can they foster more than one child? Can yes, they, they can. Uh, foster like a um, brother and sister and people like that? Another excellent question. <laughs> so yes, they can. Yes, they can. Right. Um, so the Home, what we call the home approval process. Uh -huh. And this begins at the very point of inquiry, when an individual or a family says, I'd like to become a foster parent, but I'm not quite sure how. So we go through the phase of what we call an information session, mm -hmm. which provides a family or individual with an overview of what is required, what, what is fostering, what is adopting, 
what is required to, to, to get this process going. And so we do that, then we move them into the training, the pre-training, and then we do what's called a home study. And this is where we complete a thorough assessment with safety at its core mm -hmm. of this family's ability to care for our children. Mm -hmm. If they're approved, we approve based on age as well as the number of children we believe that they have the capacity to care for. And of course, there are a lot of variables involved, but say, for example, we approve a home for either gender between the ages of 10 and 16. This individual may be approved for two, three, four kids based on their abilities. Mm -hmm. So yes, they can care for more than one child, simultaneously mm -hmm. and they can care for siblings as a matter of fact mm -hmm. we love those who care for siblings because we want to keep those siblings know together <laughs> you know there's no stronger bond than that sibling mm -hmm. you know, how bond. many movies have you seen where the they're adopted and, and they go separately and they right. want to be with their exactly. uh, siblings and everything um, I know many of the states have a um, tr uh, a time when they are dismissed from the uh, um, the, foster care system. the foster care system. Does Georgia, and what age is it that they uh, grow out of that or age out of it? So um, we legally can um, have a child in our custody up until the age of 18. Once that child turns 18 and they're legally an adult, then they make the decision of whether or not they want to remain in the custody of the department or whether they are ready to go out independently on their own. Um, they can stay in our custody, typically up to the age of 21. Um, and we have programs in place that we work with them to try to find employment, housing. Um, they, some you of don't them- don't just throw them out. No, so good. no. Some of them may still need to complete high school to receive that diploma or a GED if they chose you know, to go that route. And we have um, some staff or some kids that go into the military and seek secondary education, so college degrees. Um, and so we help fund that. Um, they can live on campus, they can do everything that um, a college kid would do. Um, we, we will supply their books and their housing and things like that. Um, we have an independent living program that we start working with kids who are age 14 and have been in our care for six months. Mm -hmm they are connected to an independent living program coordinator who works with that child to develop to independent living skills, <laughs> right? Even though they're 14 and our hopes is that that child will return home, we know that the skills will not go unused. So we start that process at 14 when these children come into care and have been in our custody for six months and that continues um, throughout their, their time with us. That is, that's very interesting because uh, you, you also see movies where this happens to a child and, and they're just thrown out on the street and say, okay, fend for yourself. So um, I always like for learning never stops and it, it, there's, it's never too early to start learning. And it's uh, just everyday skills that people need. And a, a lot of that is never taught, <laughs> unfortunately. Right. right. Um, Mark, I don't want to uh, ignore you down there. <laughs> so what are some of the pre uh, preliminary factors uh, individuals have to subject themselves in their home to become a child, uh, uh, where a child can be placed? Some of the factors, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Danny, mm -hmm. that they looked at as to where they are placed, you know, is as he touched on, you know, what the, the needs of that particular child, you know, where it's going to, you know, the, that particular family, does that particular family have the best needs for these certain individual ch children? Uh, one thing we've, I know that we've looked at, or uh, I know Dee probably tired of hearing or that I repeat myself sometimes on this. When we get to looking at these children, our main goal is to, how can we better these children? How can we make them come out of foster care better than when they came in. Amen. You know, the whole, Amen. the whole goal <laughs> is to change the direction of the cycle of that child's life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to really look at it and say, what, what can we do as individuals, not, not only just as workers, you know, and this is something also I, 
I throw it to the employees a lot because I'll send them like a, a an encouragement letter or we do like a newsletter and mm -hmm. I'll put stuff in there. But I, I just try to tell them and remind them that, you know, your job is just not like, your job's not a standard job. It is one that takes time and care and have a heart for it. And they go under a lot of stress, they do. But I try to remind them that every day when they show up to work, those individual, those, those kids that they work with, <clears throat> they're making a difference. They're making a difference. They're seeing something different or they can see something different out of this one individual that might change their mind of how they see the world mm -hmm. or how they see themselves in their position. And I tell them, you know, if you can just do your best to encourage those kids, work with those kids, so that if you could just change the, if it's just one child's life, it's worth it all. Mm -hmm. It's worth it all. And so we look at, as Mark said, we look at those homes that we put those children in to make sure it's a good fit to where it is when they come out, they feel better about themselves or they, mm -hmm. they start to nurture those kids. So certain kids need mm -hmm. different type of nurturing. Sure. We have, as Dee Dee stated, some who you know have mental challenges. So those particular families are needed to really, because mm -hmm. they may have the more, more patience or more understanding maybe there's something that, that they've worked with it long enough or maybe something in their personal life where they know how to handle those certain situations sure. so that's uh, I would think is looking at those homes uh, what what our agency does or what the, the, uh, the defects does to and also our foster care families to take care of these children and to make sure it's uh, you know I'm not gonna say uh, we love all kids no matter what but that better fit can might help with that preliminary placement and yeah. understanding. Okay, uh, this mark. <laughs> um, is there a certain age preference for foster parents? Do, do we age out? <laughs> I will say no, I will say no. And just before I answer that, well said, well said. But if I might add just a tad bit to Please. You know, that question is, one of the things we do at the very beginning is we complete comprehensive background checks. What we do not want to do is allow a prospective caregiver to go too far before we say, maybe this is not going to be a good fit. Okay. So one of the things that they have to subject themselves to is, are these background checks. Mm -hmm. And of course, that goes again to the core of safety. We're gonna do everything we possibly can to ensure that we are providing safe environments, safe homes for our children. Now, do you age out? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Good. Um, what I will say is that assessment process will take into consideration not just your age, but your physical condition. Um, I am absolutely yeah. sure I do not want to put a three-year-old rambunctious high-energy kid <laughs> with my mom because that's go not going to be a good fit. So no, you don't age up, but we take it into consideration in terms of the types of children that we're going to place in a home. Um, you've already talked about the traditional family setting. It's, it's been broadened. Yes. and everything so I'm not going to go back on uh, on that one but um, one, one of the questions is um, your department increases spending for parents participating in foster care and for the foster children um, why did you adjust your budget to the parents and the children from the previous year was there a specific uh, thing that you were wanting to do that had not been funded in the past and if anybody can answer that. So um, yeah, Mark and I um, have had a lot of discussion about how we are going to support our foster parents and the children that are uh -huh. in their home. Um, and though foster parents do receive, um, you know, a per diem rate once they are having a foster child in their home, it doesn't cover many of the things that they pay out of their pocket to make sure that that child has the same experiences as the foster parent's own children or another child in the school. 
So Mark and I... You know, you, that's, yeah. a, that's a good point. They may have their own children in there. Sure. In the family. And if they bring a foster child in that uh, does not have the, um, the funds to uh, kind of be on the same uh, level as their own children, that could cause some sibling arguing <laughs> <laughs> problems. It could, and our goal is, is that <clears throat> foster parents treat the foster child as if it, as if the child was their own. Yeah. Um, and so Mark and I had a lot of discussion about a year ago around, um, you know, what, what does this look like? And at that time, Douglas County um, really didn't do a lot of reimbursable items for foster parents that they pay out of their pocket. And so we had this discussion about how can we support a more, um, we added in there that they get reimbursed for having birthday parties for the kids. Mm -hmm. So that birthday gifts and balloons and cakes and all of that, now the foster parents feel more comfortable of doing having those activities for that child That's and celebration important. Important. because we will supply that. Mm -hmm. um, diapers, how many of us know diapers are so expensive? And so we added in that, um, you know, foster parents can get reimbursed for purchasing diapers for these young kids. Um, bike helmets, car seats, um, haircuts. That was something else. A lot of our kids, you know, they want to feel good when they uh, go, to school. go to school. They want to have their hair done and, and crisply crispy seniors. cut. Um, <laughs> so we wanted to make sure that the foster parents the, had the, or the, the high school yearbook. Yep. Yeah, yes. things like that. I we see. added that as well. <laughs> um, we added yearbooks and, and different extracurricular, like band activities, and um, you know, that can be very costly to a parent. Um, and a foster parent, and so um, Mark and I felt that we saw this need, and we readjusted um, our budget to include much more, um, many more reimbursable items for our foster parents. Well, that's good. It's very important. That they feel they have a fit, yes. you know, uh, in the family and everything. So, uh, what advice do you have for other people who are considering foster care? To become a foster parent? Yeah. Do you want to go, Mark? I guess at first it starts with the heart. Oh yeah. You know, you have to have <laughs> you have to have a desire to want to help to, like I said earlier, to want to you know try to help a child in need uh, who might not have <clears throat> or might who have might had situations in their life that other families don't normally see, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> you know just. Uh, one thing that I, I, I've tried to imagine, because, you know, we're not, the board is not in the everyday, you know, I would say nuts going and on. Nuts and bolts. <laughs> of the facts. And, but we, we sit back and we try to place ourselves or think in that mind of, you know, these poor children. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one thing that just a touch back, we was talking about the, like the, the, finance, the policy change. We sat and we thought, you know, we want this child to feel like any other child. Mm -hmm. It's very important for that. Mm -hmm. And so we said, you know, what can we do to help, not only with foster parent recruitment, but also these children? We thought, well, if we could lighten the financial burden on some of these families, because the, uh, nothing was, I mean, the old policy just needed to be updated. Right. And so, like you said, we sat back and we looked at our budget of how our spending was going that year and we forecasted we said okay we know we can afford to spend this much more and this much more would greatly help these foster parents and these foster families mm -hmm. so knowing we thought well maybe there might be some help that the board can assist with uh, helping this amount of funds that goes back to the reimbursements for these foster families to help them with their decision on wanting to become a foster parent you know all of us have a good heart. Uh, there's a lot of people who would love to do certain things, but sometimes finances just hold you back. Mm -hmm. And we thought if we could eliminate that to lighten that burden to where they can say, okay, I can do this. And it's not for the money, but the money's there to help them, you know, raise these children. Uh, you know, that, that would be, I would say, some of the things that we, we have done to try to encourage or try to help some of these fam these families become foster parents. And my my advice to anybody who wants to become is if 
If you have that passion, if you want to help children in foster care, then make that inquiry. Um, and because, that was my next question. Yes. So I'm going to let Mark um, answer. Um, yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to tell everyone how do they contact or who do they contact uh, about becoming a foster parent. You know, one of the interesting things about that question, that previous question, is what advice do you have for anyone who has an interest in becoming? And we have, by the way, modified the term that we use currently in the agency for foster parents. We are, have moved away from using the term foster parents in a general context to partnership parent. And that covers both fostering and adoptions. And the reason why we moved towards partnership parents as opposed to foster parent is because we're trying to create a partnership between our caregivers, the agency, our board, the children, the school. It's an entire system. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And all stakeholders has to play a crucial role in that process. Mm -hmm. And so we're all partners. Now, what advice do I have for anyone who would like to become a partnership parent? It's okay, don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you why. I love onions. And this might I seem very you. weird, but I love onions, particularly red onions. But you know when you go to the store and you get one of those bags, it's like a two pound bag of onions. When you shake it, all kinds of stuff comes off, right? <laughs> and that's not really desirable. You have to take it home. You have to get the onion out of the bag. Mm -hmm. You have to get all that shelly stuff off. And when you get to the core, and then you dice it, and you saute it, and that aroma comes up, it's quite different from <laughs> all that stuff that fell off, right? <clears throat> My point is this, sometimes people look at our children and all they can see is that stuff that fell off, which is really the trauma that some of our children have experienced. Mm -hmm. And who can blame them? They didn't ask for that. Mm -hmm. So if we are patient with them and we go through the process with them, getting off all that stuff, when you get to the core, Oh my goodness, it's amazing, isn't it? That's our children, full of potential, full of potential. So don't be scared, it's okay. Work with us, we'll work with you and get you there. So if you'd like to become a partnership parent, it's very simple, www.fostergeorgia.com or one eight seven seven. 210 kids. 1877 210 kids. Very well said. Um, is there anything any of you want to add to what we've talked about today? I just want to say, first, I, again, I want to thank you, Commissioner, for inviting us for, to talk about this important topic. This is not just a Douglas County defects area of need. This is a statewide defects. It's a nationwide defects um, need. We, we, um, we want to have foster homes within our communities to try and keep our children who are no, can no longer stay at their you know, home with mom and dad, but have a chance to stay in the same school system to have the same friends, the same teachers, to stay in the same community. They're visiting the same stores that they've always visited. Um, and we, we, that's a need that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, only having, you know, 42 foster homes in Douglas County um, serving 200 and, 205 children, you know, there really is a, a need for these kids um, to be placed within their communities so they can stay So there. does this delay their placement because you're of the shortage or do you have to go outside of Douglas County? <laughs> oh, sometimes it does, especially when we talked about earlier with some of those higher needs children um, that we have very um, a hard time finding a family to match up to meet the needs of the child. Mm -hmm. um, and these, you know, it, it does delay them um, having to sit in the office for hours uh, throughout the day and even into the evening, which is no place 
a child yeah. wants to be, um, while we're waiting to find a, a foster home or placement. So, anyone else? And we're, we're we're asking families who are willing to care for children in the age group, say ten up, you know, ten to sixteen, ten to seventeen age group, to partner with us. Um, a lot of our prospective caregivers are willing to do you know, the little babies, the cutesies, yeah. and that's fine, that's fine. We're not, you know, <laughs> discouraging anyone from doing that, mm -hmm. but we are looking for individuals willing to care for our older children because we do have a significant amount um, of that 205, there is a good percentage, probably 50% or more, that is in that 10 to 16, 10 to 17 age group. And so we're really looking for individuals willing to partner with us to help. And we do, even after initial approval, we have ongoing trainings. So we're not going to approve you and, as you said earlier, send you out into the world and leave you to the wolves. No. We have ongoing trainings. Um, for example, every single month we have a foster parent call. It's virtual. And we provide what we call um, trust-based relational or relationship training. It's called TBRI, Trust-Based Relational Intervention Training. Mm -hmm. And what it does, it looks at the most, for want of a better term, cutting edge approach to helping children with a lot of you know, emotional trauma. And we're helping you developing the skills as a partnership parent to be able to parent these children based on their needs. So we're definitely providing those supports you know, to foster parents. So yes, come on board. We'll, we'll you ever you. have a, like a day seminar that people that are thinking about it and they might want to just come and listen to um, the possibility of being a foster parent? <laughs> we don't have a day seminar, but what we do have are what we call information sessions. Okay. And currently those are being offered virtually as well. Right. You know, we want to be mindful of you know, the fact that some people do not want to be in a room, <laughs> you know, currently, but we do offer those virtually. So we do have an information session. And what that does, it provides an overview of all the different parent categories that we do offer, as well as provide the opportunity for um, prospective caregivers to ask questions. And we, that's where we spend the bulk of our time, answering questions about their concerns, how to go about it, what's a good fit for them. So yes, we do have that. Has the pandemic had an impact on uh, people volunteering to be foster parents? I'm, I'm not sure if it has, because we do still have a good bit of inquiries. I think the disparity between the number of inquiries and the number of individuals continuing with the process, I think that is where we're concerned. And I'm, I can only assume that based on the information they receive during that information session, they kind of get a little bit scared, but we're constantly making the appeal that, hey, listen, it's really no need to be scared. But you, sounds like you all strive to make sure that no child falls through the cracks and everything. And I commend all of y'all for what you do for not only Douglas County, but just for the kids. And, uh, and um, so if, is there anything else that anybody wants to share? And I'd like to say I, I thank all the foster families. You know, they're, yeah. ne they're never thanked enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I thank God for our foster families every yes. day. And, you know, all the partnerships that we have throughout the county, those who have stepped up and, you know, taken the time and thought about the kids, donated items. Uh, Exodus, Ran Exodus, Exodus Ranch, I believe, is right across the uh, interstate over there. What they is have. That? I'm sorry. It's a ranch right Exodus. across. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I know and it's they put on a foster right. family day <laughs> every year. And it's just for the foster parents to sit back and relax. They have massages and stuff for them. The sheriff's department jumps in. They bring their ice cream truck. There's balloons, <laughs> water slides. And you have all these beautiful children just run around and people volunteer. My wife and I did this a couple of years ago. You just spend the day with these children. And I'm telling you, if you ever want to become a foster parent, if you're ever thinking about it, volunteer and come spend that day. Those kids are so loving. They just... It, it, it was a blessing that day, but I thank them for taking the time to, for all. I mean, if you've seen it, it's spectacular what they do, but all the partners, but we want to thank our foster families and obviously our, our departments. Yeah, our, our department workers, heads our and department our staff, staff. Yes, and your staff. They are, they yeah. are fantastic. We, I yeah. think we have the best. <clears throat> the hands-on people. 
with that said, thank you each and every one of y'all for being here. Uh, this has been very enlightening. And uh, I um, just appeal to the public, if you're even thinking about it, contact them and get to, uh, get to know more about the foster uh, process. And um, just, uh, it would have to be a calling, I think. Uh, you know, a politician has to have a calling most of the time. And our, our, uh, someone that works with uh, Celebrate Recovery, I think, you know, people like that, that open their hearts to hear the problems that e exist and try to heal that process uh, or be the hands and the feet to heal it. But I just um, ask that you just think about it. Um, and if you have any inkling whatsoever, you might want to talk to one of these people again. <laughs> so with that, um, I uh, will bid you good day and thank you for watching.